we would like to present Gala Night by P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> the bar parlor of the Angler's Rest was fuller than usual. Our local race meeting had been held during the afternoon, and this always means a rush of custom. In addition to the habitués, that faithful little band of listeners which sits nightly at the feet of me, Mr. Mulliner, <laughs> there were present some half a dozen strangers. One of these, a fair-haired young stout and mild, wore the unmistakable air of a man who has not been fortunate in his selections. He sat staring before him with dull eyes and a drooping jaw, and nothing that his companions could do seemed to be able to cheer him up. A genial sherry and bitters, one of the regular patrons, eyed the sufferer with bluff sympathy. sympathy. What your friend appears to need, gentlemen, is a dose of Mulliner's Buck You Uppo. What's Mulliner's Buck You Uppo? Never heard of it myself. He is referring to a tonic invented by my brother Wilfred, the well-known analytical chemist. It is not often administered to human beings, having been designed primarily to encourage elephants in India to conduct themselves with an easy nonchalance during the tiger hunts, which are so popular in that country. But occasionally human beings do partake of it with impressive results. I was telling the company here not long ago of the remarkable effect it had on my nephew, Augustine, the curate. It bucked him up, did it? <laughs> it bucked him up very considerably. It acted on his bishop, too, when he tried it in a similar manner. It is undoubtedly a most efficient tonic, strong and invigorating. How is Augustine, by the way? Extremely well. I received a letter from him only this morning. I'm not sure if I told you, but he's a vicar now at Walsingford below Shivney on Thames. <laughs> a delightful resort. Mostly honeysuckle and apple-cheeked villagers. Anything been happening to him lately? It is strange that you should ask that. In this letter to which I allude, he has quite an interesting story to relate. It deals with the loves of Ronald Bracy Gascoigne and Hypatia Wace. Hypatia is a school friend of my nephew's wife. She has been staying at the vicarage, nursing her through a sharp attack of mumps. She is also the niece and ward of Augustine's superior of the cloth, the Bishop of Stortford. Was that the bishop who took the buck you up, oh? The same. As for Ronald Bracy Gascoigne, he is a young man of independent means who resides in the neighborhood. He is, of course, one of the Berkshire Bracy Gascoignes. <clears throat> <laughs> Ronald. Now, if there is a name I never cared for. <laughs> In that respect, you differ from Hypatia Wace. She thought it swell. She loved Ronald Bracy Gascoigne with all the fervor of a young girl's heart. And they were provisionally engaged to be married. Provisionally, I say, because the fire before the firing squad could actually be assembled. <laughs> It was necessary for the young couple to obtain the consent of the Bishop of Stortford. Mark that, gentlemen. Their engagement was subject to the Bishop of Stortford's consent. This was the snag that protruded jaggedly from the middle of the primrose path of their happiness. And for quite a while, it seemed as if Cupid must inevitably stub his toe on it. I will select as the point at which to begin my tale a lovely evening in June when all nature seemed to smile, and the rays of the setting sun fell like molten gold upon the picturesque garden of the vicarage at Walsingford below Shidney on Thames. On a rustic bench beneath a spreading elm, Hypatia Wace and Ronald Bracy Gascoigne watched the shadows lengthening across the smooth lawn. And to the girl, there appeared something symbolical and ominous about this creeping blackness. She shivered. To her, it was as if the sun-bathed lawn represented her happiness and the shadows, the doom that was creeping upon it. Are you uh, doing anything at the moment, Ronnie? Eh, what? Doing anything? Oh, you mean doing anything? No, I'm not doing anything. Then kiss me! Uh, right ho, I see what you mean. Rather a scheme, I will. He did so. 
And for some moments, they clung together in a close embrace. Then Ronald, releasing her gently, began to slap himself between the shoulder blades. Ethel or something. Uh, down my back, probably fell off the tree. Kiss me again. In one second, old girl, the instant I've dealt with that beetle or something. Would you mind just fetching me a whack on about the fourth knob of the spine, reading from the top downwards? I fancy that would make it think a bit. Is this the time to be talking of beetles? Well, you know, don't you know? They seem rather to force themselves on you, uh, on your attention when they get down your back. I dare say you've had the same experience yourself. I don't suppose in the ordinary way I mention beetle, mention beetles half a dozen times a year, but I should say the fifth gnaw would be about the spot now. A good sharp slosh with plenty of follow through ought to do the trick. Papacia clenched her hands. She was seething with that febrile exasperation which, since the days of Eve, has come upon women who find themselves linked to a cloth head. You poor sap! You keep babbling about beetles, and you don't appear to realize that if you want to kiss me, you'd better cram in all the kissing you can get to right now while the going is good. It doesn't seem to have occurred to you that after tonight, you are going to have to fade out of the picture. Oh, I say no. Why? My Uncle Percy arrived this evening. The bishop? Yes, and Aunt Priscilla. And you think they won't be any too frightfully keen on me? I know they won't. <laughs> I wrote and told them that we were engaged, and I had a letter this afternoon saying, quite clearly, that you would not do. No, I say, really. Oh, I say, dash it. Out of the question, my uncle said, and underlined it. Not really? Not absolutely underlined it? Yes, twice and in black ink. A cloud darkened the young man's face. The beetle had begun to try out a few tentative dance steps on the small of his back, but he ignored it. A tiller troop of beetles could not have engaged his attention now. But what's he got against me? Well, for one thing, he's heard that you were sent down from Oxford. But all the best men are. Look at what's his name? <laughs> Chap who wrote poems, Sh shellac or some such name. <laughs> and he knows you dance a lot? What's wrong with dancing? I'm not very well up on these things, but didn't David dance before Saul? Or am I thinking of a couple of other fellows? Anyway, I know that somebody danced before somebody and was extremely highly thought of in consequence. David? I'm not saying it was David, mind you. It may quite easily have been Samuel. David? Or even Nehemiah, son of Bimshi, or something like that. David or Samuel or Nimshi, the son of Bimshi, did not dance at the home from home. Her allusion was to the latest of those frivolous nightclubs which spring up from time to time on the reaches of the Thames, which are within a comfortable distance from London. This one stood some half a mile from the vicarage gates. Is that what the bish is beefing about? You don't mean to tell me that he really objects to the home from home. Why, a cathedral couldn't be more rigidly respectable. Does he realize that the place has only been raided five times in the whole course of its existence? A few simple words of explanation will put this all right. I'll have a talk with the old boy. No, it's no use talking. He has made up his mind. One of the things he said in his letter was that, rather than countenance my union to a worthless worldling like you, he would gladly see me turned into a pillar of salt, like Lot's wife, Genesis 1926. And yes. nothing could be fairer than that, could it? So I would suggest that you start kissing me immediately and fold me in your arms and cover my face with kisses. It's the last chance you'll get. The young man was about to follow her advice, for he could see that there was much in what she said. But at this moment, there came from the direction of the house the sound of a manly voice trolling the psalm for the second Sunday after Septuagesima. And an instant later, their host, the Reverend Augustine Mulliner, appeared in sight. 
He saw them and came hurrying across the garden, leaping over the flower beds with extraordinary lissomeness. <laughs> Amazing elasticity that bird has, both physical and mental. How does he get that way? Well, he was telling me last night. He has a tonic which he takes regularly. It's called Mulliner's Buck You up -o, and it acts directly on the red corpuscles. I wish he would give the vicious swig of it. A sudden light of hope came into his eyes. Hmm. I say, hip old girl, that's rather a notion. Don't you think it's rather a notion? It looks to me like something of an idea. If the bish were to deep, dip his beak into the stuff, it might make him take a brighter view of me. Hypatia, like all girls who intend to be good wives, made it a practice to look on any suggestions thrown out by her future lord and master as fatuous and futile. I never heard anything so silly. Well, I wish you would try it. No harm in trying it, what? Of course, I shall do nothing of the kind. Well, I do think you might try it. I mean, try it, don't you know? He could speak no further on the matter, for now they were no longer alone. Augustine had come up. His kindly face looked grave. I say, Ronnie, old bloke, I don't want to hurry you, but I think you ought to be informed that the bishes, male and female, are even now on their way up from the station. I should be popping if I were you. The prudent man looketh well to his going. Proverbs 14, 15. <laughs> All right. I suppose you wouldn't care to sneak out tonight and come have one final spot of shoe slithering at the home from home? It's a gala night. Might be fun, what? Give us a chance of saying goodbye properly and all that. Well, I never heard of anything so silly. Of course I'll come. Oh, right, ho! Meet you down the road at twelve, then. He walked swiftly away and presently was lost to sight behind the shrubbery. Hypatia turned with a choking sob, and Augustine took her hand and squeezed it gently. <laughs> Cheer up, old onion. Don't lose hope. Remember, many waters cannot quench love. Song of Solomon, 10 7. I don't see what quenching love has got to do with it. Our trouble is that we've got an uncle complete with gaiters and a hat with bootlaces on it who can't see Ronnie with a telescope. I know. And my heart bleeds for you. I've been through all this sort of thing myself. When I was trying to marry Jane, I was stymied by a father-in-law that had to be seen to be believed. I a chap, I assure you, who combined the temper of an animal with the ability to bend pokers around his biceps. Tact was what won him over, and tact is what I propose to employ in your case. I have an idea in the back of my mind. I won't tell you what it is, but you may take it from me. It's the real Tabasco. Oh, how kind you are, Augustine. It comes from mixing with Boy Scouts. You may have noticed the village is stiff with them. But don't you worry, old girl. I owe you a lot for the way you've looked after Jane these weeks, and I'm going to see you through. If I can't fix up your little affair, I'll eat my hymns, ancient and modern, and uncooked at that. And with these brave words, Augustine Mulliner turned two handsprings, vaulted over the rustic bench, and went about his duties in the parish. Augustine was rather relieved when he came down to dinner that night to find that Hypatia was not to be among those present. The girl was taking her meal on a tray with Jane, his wife, in the invalid bedroom, and he was consequently able to embark with freedom on the discussion of her affairs with the bishop and his wife. As soon as the servants had left the room, accordingly, he addressed himself to the task. Now listen, you two dear souls. What I want to talk to you about, now that we are alone, is this business of Hypatia and Ronald Bracy Gasquania. The Lady Bishopess pursed her lips, displeased. She was a woman of ample and majestic build. A friend of Augustine's who had been attached to the tank corps during the war had once said that he knew nothing that brought the old days back more vividly than the sight of her. All she needed, he maintained, was a steering wheel and a couple of machine guns, and you could have moved her up into any front line and no questions asked. Please, Mr. Molina. Augustine was not to be deterred. Like all the Moliners, he was at heart a man of reckless courage. 
They tell me you're thinking of bunging a spanner into the works. Not true, I hope. Quite true, Mr. Molinar. Am I not right, Percy? Quite. We have made careful inquiries about the young man and are satisfied that he is entirely unsuitable. Would you say that? A pretty good egg. I've always found him to be. What's your main objection to the poor lizard? We learn that he is frequently to be seen dancing at an advanced hour, not only in gilded London nightclubs, but even in what should be the pure atmosphere of Wallingsford below Chivigny on the Thames. There is a resort in the neighborhood known, I believe, as the Home from Home. Yes, just down the road. It's gala night tonight, as it happens. If you care to look in, fancy dress is optional. I understand that he is to be seen there almost nightly. Now, against dancing quad dancing, I have nothing to say. Properly conducted, it is a pleasing and innocuous pastime. In my own younger days, I myself was no mean exponent of the mean exponent of the polka, the Shaughnessy, and the Roger de Coverley. <laughs> Indeed, it was a dance in aid of the distressed daughters of the clergymen of the church. England Relief Fund that I first met my husband. Really? Well, cheerio. But dancing, as the term is understood nowadays, is another matter. I had no doubt that what you call a gala night would prove on inspection to be little less than one of those orgies oh. where perfect strangers of both sexes unblushingly throw their colored celluloid balls at one another and in other ways behave in a manner more suitable to the cities of the plain than to our dear England. No, Mr. Molyneux, if this young man, Ronald Bracy Gascogna, is in the habit of frequenting places of this type, like the home from home, he is not a fit mate for the pure young girl like my niece, Patia. Am I not correct, Percy? Perfectly correct, my dear. Oh, right-ho, then, said Augustine, and turned the conversation to the forthcoming Pan-Anglican Synod. <laughs> Living in the country had given Augustine Mulliner the excellent habit of going early to bed. He had a sermon to compose on the morrow, <laughs> and in order to be fresh and at his best in the morning, he retired shortly before eleven. And as he had anticipated an unbroken eight hours of refreshing sleep, it was with no little annoyance that he became aware, towards midnight, of a hand on his shoulder which belonged to the Bishop of Stortford, shaking him. Oh, hello! Anything wrong? Ah! Oh. <laughs> Nothing, my dear fellow. In fact, very much the reverse. How are you, Mr. Mulliner? Um, I, I feel fine, Bish. I'll bet you two chasubles and a hassock that you don't feel as fine as I do. <laughs> there must be something in the air of this place. I haven't felt like this since the boat race night of the year 1893. Wow! <laughs> Whoopee! <laughs> How godly are they, thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. Numbers 44, 5. And gripping the rail of the bed, he endeavored to balance himself on his hands with his feet in the air. <laughs> Augustine looked at him with growing concern. He could not rid himself of a curious feeling that there was something sinister behind this ebullience. <laughs> Often before, he had seen his guest in a mood of dignified animation, for the robust cheerfulness of the other's outlook was famous in ecclesiastical circles. But here, surely, was something more than dignified animation. The bishop completed his gymnastics and sat down on the bed. Yes, I feel like a fighting cock, Mulliner. I'm full of beans. And the idea of wasting time in the golden hours of the night in bed seemed so silly that I had to get up and look in upon you for a chat. Now, this is what I want to speak to you about. My dear fellow, I wonder if you recollect, recollect writing to me, oh, round about epiphany I would, would have been, to tell me of the hit you made in the Boy Scouts pantomime here. You played Sinbad the Sailor, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's right. Well, what I came here to ask, my dear Mulliner, was this. Can you, by any chance, 
Lay your hand on that Sinbad costume. I want to borrow it, if I may. What, what for? Never mind what for, <laughs> Milliner. Sufficient for you to know the motives of the soundest churchmanship render it essential for me to have that suit. Uh, very well, Bish. Uh, I'll find it for you tomorrow. Tomorrow will not do. <laughs> this dilatory spirit of putting things off, this sluggish attitude of lazy fare and procrastination <laughs> are scarcely what I expected in you, Mulliner. But there, let's say no more. Just dig up that Sinbad costume and look slippy about it, and we'll forget the whole matter. What does it look like? Uh, just an ordinary sailor suit, Bish. Excellent. Some species of headgear goes with it, I presume? A, a, a cap that says HMS Blotto on it. Admirable. <laughs> then, my dear fellow, if you will just let me have it, I'll trouble you no further tonight. Your day's toil in the vineyard has earned repose. The sleep of the laboring man is sweet. Ecclesiastes 5.12. As the door closed behind his guest, Augustine was conscious of a definite uneasiness. Only once before had he seen his spiritual superior in quite this exalted condition. That had been two years ago when they had gone down to Harchester College to unveil the statue of Lord Hemel of Hempstead. On that occasion, he recollected, the bishop, under the influence of an overdose of Buck Uepo, had not been content with unveiling the statue. He had gone out in the small hours of the night and painted it pink. <laughs> Augustine could still recall the surge of emotion which had come upon him when, leaning out of the window, he had observed the prelate climbing up the water spout on his way back to his room, and he still remembered the sorrowful pity with which he had listened to the other's lame explanation that he was a cat belonging to the cook. Sleep, in the present circumstances, was out of the question. With a pensive sigh, Augustine slipped on a dressing gown and went downstairs to his study. It would ease his mind, he thought, to do a little work on that sermon of his. Augustine's study was on the ground floor, looking onto the garden. It was a lovely night, and he opened the French windows, the better to enjoy the soothing sense of the flowers beyond. Then, seating himself at his desk, he began to work. The task of composing a sermon which should practically make sense and yet not be above the heads of his rustic flock was always one that caused Augustine Mulliner to concentrate tensely. Soon he was lost in his labor and oblivious to everything but the problem of how to find word of one syllable that means supralapsinarianism. <laughs> a glaze of preoccupation had come over his eyes and the tip of his tongue, protruding from the left corner of his mouth, revolved in slow circles. From this waking trance, he emerged slowly to the realization that somebody was speaking his name and that he was no longer alone in the room. Seated in his armchair, her lithe young body wrapped in a green dressing gown, was Hypatia Wace. Hello, you're here. Hello, yes, I'm here. I thought you had gone to the home from home to meet Ronald. Well, we never made it. Ronnie, Ronnie rang up to say that he had a private tip that the place was to be raided tonight. So we thought it safe, better not to start off on anything. Quite right. Prudence first. Whosoever thou takest in hand, remember the end, and thou shalt never do amiss. Ecclesiastes 7.36. <laughs> And I saw the light, so I came down. I'm so miserable, Augustine. About this Ronnie business? Yes. There, there. Everything's going to be hotsy totsy. I don't see how you can make that out. Have you heard Uncle Percy and Aunt Priscilla talk about Ronnie? They could be, they couldn't be more off that poor unfortunate fish if he were the scarlet woman of Babylon. Uh, I know, I know. But as I hinted this afternoon, I have a little plan. I have been giving your case a good deal of thought, and I think you will agree with me that it is your Aunt Priscilla who is the real trouble. Sweeten her, and the bish will follow her lead. What she thinks today, he will always think tomorrow. 
In other words, if we can win her over, he will give his consent in a minute. Am I wrong or am I right? Yes, that's right as far as it goes. Uncle Percy always does what Aunt Priscilla tells him to. But how are you going to sweeten her? With Mulliner's fuck you up -o. You remember how often I have spoken to you of the properties of this admirable tonic? It changes your whole mental outlook like magic. We have only to sip, slip a few drops into your Aunt Priscilla's hot milk, and you will be amazed at the results. You really guarantee that? Absolutely. Oh, well, that's fine, because that's exactly what I did this evening. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie was suggesting it when you came up this afternoon, and I thought, well, I might as well try it. I found the bottle in the cupboard in there, and I put some in Aunt Priscilla's hot milk, and in order to make a good job of it, I put some on Uncle Percy's oh. potty, too. An icy hand seemed to clutch at Augustine's heart. He began to understand the inwardness of the recent scene in his bedroom. How much? Oh, oh not much. I didn't want to poison the dear old things. Just about a tablespoon of oh. ice. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you are aware that the medium dose for an adult elephant is a teaspoonful? No. <laughs> yes, the most fearful consequences result from anything in the nature of an overdose. Oh, huh. no wonder the bishop seemed a little strange in manner just now. Did he seem strange in his manner? Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> he came into my room and did handsprings on the end of the bed and then went away in my Sinbad the Sailor outfit. What did he want that for? I scarcely dare to face the thought, but can he be, have been contemplating going to the home from home? It's gala night, remember? Why, of course. And that must be why Aunt Priscilla came to me about an hour ago and asked me if I could lend her my Columbine costume. She did? She certainly did. I couldn't think of what she would want it for, but now, of course, I see. Oh, uh, r run up to her room and see if she's still there. Okay. I'm not very much mistaken. We have sown the wind, and we shall reap the wind whirlwind. Hosea 8-7. The girl hurried away, and Augustine began to pace the floor feverishly. He had completed five laps and was beginning a sixth, when there was a noise outside the French windows, and a sailorly form shot through and fell panting into the armchair. Fish! <sighs> the bishop waved a hand to indicate that he would be with him as soon as he had attended to this matter of taking in a fresh supply of breath and continued to pant. Augustine watched him, deeply concerned. There was a shop-soiled look about his guest. Part of the Sinbad costume had been torn away as if by some irresistible force, and the hat was missing. His worst fears appeared to have been realized. Fish, what has been happening? <sighs> <sighs> oh, so binge. Tell me what happened. <laughs> the bishop reflected, arranging his facts in chronological order. <laughs> well, when I got to the home from home, everybody was dancing. Nice orchestra, nice tune, nice floor. So I danced too. You danced? Certainly I danced, Mulliner. <laughs> A hornpipe. I consider it the duty of the higher clergy on these occasions to set an example. You didn't suppose I would go to a place like the home from home to play solitaire. <laughs> Harmless relaxation is not forbidden, I believe. But can you dance? Can I dance? <laughs> can I dance? Mulliner, have you ever heard of Nijinsky? <laughs> yes. My stage name. <laughs> Augustine swallowed tensely. Who did you dance with? At first I danced alone, but then most fortunately my dear wife arrived, looking perfectly charming in some sort of filmy material, and we danced together. But wasn't she surprised to see you there? Not in the least. Why should she be? Uh, oh, I don't know. Then why did you put the question? Uh, I wasn't thinking. Always think before you speak, Bonner. Oh, oh, she's not there. Uncle! Ah, <laughs> oh, my dear. But what I was telling you, Bonner, 
After we'd been dancing for some time, a most annoying thing occurred. Just as we were enjoying ourselves, everybody cutting up and having a good time, who should come in but a lot of interfering policemen? A most brusque and unpleasant body of men. Inquisitive, too. One of them kept asking my name and address, but I soon put a stop to all of that sort of nonsense. I plugged him in the eye. <laughs> you plugged him in the eye? I plugged him in the eye, Eleanor. That's when I got this suit torn. The fellow was annoying me intensely. He ignored my repeated statement that I gave my name and address only to my oldest and closest friends. <laughs> and had the audacity to clutch me by what I suppose a costumier would describe as the slack of my garment. Well, naturally, I plugged him in the eye. I come of a fighting line, Mulliner. My ancestor, Bishop, Bishop Orlo, was famous in William the Conqueror's day for his work with the battle axe. So I biffed this bird, and did he take a toss? Ask me. <laughs> Don't interrupt, my child. I cannot marshal my thoughts if you keep in persistent interrupting. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, then the already existing state of confusion grew intensified. The whole tempo of the proceedings became, as it were, quickened. Somebody turned out the lights, and somebody else set up, set, upset a table, and I decided to come away. I trust that my dear wife also contrived to leave without undue inconvenience. The last I saw of her, she was diving through one of the windows in a manner which I thought showed considerable lizardness and resource. Ah, here she is, and looking none the worse for her adventures. Save me, Percy, save me! Certainly, my dear. What from? In silence, the Lady Bishopess pointed at the window. Through it, like some figure of doom, was striding a policeman. He, too, was breathing in a labored manner, like one touched in the wind. The bishop drew himself up. And what, pray, is the meaning of this interruption? Aha! He closed the windows and stood with his back against them. It seemed to Augustine the moment had arrived for a man of tact to take the situation in hand. Good evening, Constable. You appear to have been taking exercise. I have no doubt that you would enjoy a little refreshment. The policeman licked his lips but did not speak. I have an excellent tonic here in my cupboard, and I think you will find it most restorative. I will mix it then with a little seltzer. The policeman took the glass, but in a preoccupied manner. His attention was still riveted on the bishop and his consort. Oh, you have I? I fail to understand you, officer. I've been chasing her a good while. It must mind, it must have been. Then you acted in a most offensive and uncalled for way. On her physician's recommendation, my dear wife, takes a short cross-country run <laughs> each night before returning to rest. Things have come to a sorry pass if she cannot follow her doctor's orders without being pursued, I'll use a stronger word, chivvy, by the constabulary. And it was by her doctor's orders that she went to the urn from him, eh? I shall be vastly surprised to learn that my dear wife has been anywhere near the resort you mentioned. And you were there, too. I saw you. Observe. I saw you punch Constable Booker in the eye, I did. Ridiculous. If you weren't there, what were you doing wearing that sailor suit? The bishop raised his eyebrows. <laughs> I cannot permit my choice of costume. Arrived at, I need scarcely say, only after much reflection and meditation, to be criticized by a man who habitually goes about in public in a blue uniform and a helmet. <laughs> What, may I inquire, is it that you object to in this sailor suit? There's nothing wrong, I venture to believe, nothing degrading in a sailor suit. Many of England's greatest men have worn sailor suits. Nelson, Admiral Beatty. And Arthur Prince. And as you say, Arthur Prince. The policeman was scowling darkly. As a dialectician, he seemed to be feeling he was outmatched. 
And yet, he appeared to be telling himself there must be some answer even to the apparently unanswerable logic to which he had just been listening. To assist thought, he raised the glass of Bacuapo and seltzer in his hand and drained it at a draft. And as he did so, suddenly, abruptly, as breath fades from steel, the scowl passed from his face, and in its stead there appeared a smile of infinite kindness and goodwill. He wiped his mustache and began to chuckle to himself as at some diverting memory. <laughs> Made me laugh, that did, when old Booker went head over heels that time. Don't you know what? I've never seen a nicer punch. Clean, crisp. Don't suppose it traveled more than six inches, did it? I reckon you've done a bit of boxing in your time, sir. At the sight of the constable's smiling face, the bishop had relaxed the austerity of his demeanor. He no longer looked like Savonarola rebuking the sins of the people. <laughs> Quite was... true, officer. When I was a somewhat younger man than I am at present, I won the curate's open heavyweight championship two years in succession. Some of the ancient skill still lingers, it would seem. I should say it does, sir. But what all the fuss was about is more than I can say. Our fat-headed inspector says, you go ride that home from home, chap, see, he says. And so we went and done it. But my art wasn't in it. No more than any of the other fellas' arts in it. In it. What's wrong with a little rational enjoyment? That's what I say. What's wrong with it? Precisely, officer. That's what I say. What's wrong with it? Let people enjoy themselves how they like is what I say. And if the police come interfering, well, punch them in the eye, I say. Same as you did, Constable Booker. That's what I say. Exactly. A fellow of considerable intelligence, my dear. Yes, my dear. I, yeah. I liked his face right from the beginning. What is your name, officer? Smith, lady, but call me Cyril. Certainly, it will be a pleasure to do so. I used to know some Smiths in Lincolnshire some years ago. Cyril, Cyril, I wonder if they were any relation. Maybe, lady, it's a small world. Though now I come to think of it, their name was Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's likely, isn't it? That's just about what it is, Cyril. You never spoke a truer word. Into this love feast, which threatened to become more glutinous every moment, there cut the cold voice of Apatia Wace. Well, I must say, you're a nice lot. Who's a nice lot, lady? These two. Are you married, officer? No, lady. I'm just a solitary chip drifting on the river of life. <laughs> well, anyway, I expect you know how it feels to be in love. Too true, lady. Well, I'm in love with Mr. Brace Gascoigne. You've met him, probably. Wouldn't you say that he's a person of the highest character? The whitest man I know, lady. Well, I want to marry him. And my uncle and aunt here, they won't let me because they say he's worldly. Just because he goes out dancing, and all the while, here they are, dancing the soles of their shoes off. I don't call that fair. She buried her face in his hands with a stifled sob. The bishop and his wife looked at each other in blank astonishment. I don't understand. Nor I. My dear child, what is all this about not consenting to your marriage with Mr. Bracey Gascoigne? Where did you get that idea in your head? Certainly, as far as I'm concerned, you may marry Mr. Bracy Glasconia. And I think I speak for my dear husband. Quite. Most decidedly. Good Ed! May I really? Certainly you may. You have no objection, Cyril. None at all, lady. <laughs> oh, dear. What's the matter? It just struck me that I've got to wait two hours before I can tell him. Just think of it, having to wait for hours and hours. Why, why, why wait hours and hours, my dear? Because he's gone to no bed. No time like the present. Oh, but he's gone to bed. Well, route him out. Here's what I suggest that we should do. You and I and Priscilla and you, Cyril, will all go down to the house and stand under his window and shout. Or throw gravel at the window. Cer certainly, my dear, if you prefer it. And when he sticks his head out, how would it be to add the garden 
nose handy and squirt him. <laughs> Cause a lot of fun and laughter that would. Oh, my dear Cyril, you think of everything. I shall certainly use my influence, whatever influence I may possess with the authorities, to have you promoted to a rank where your remarkable talents will enjoy greater scope. Come, let us be going. You will accompany us, dear Milliner? Uh, a sermon to write, Bish. Just as you say, Milliner. But if you'll be so good as to leave the window open, my dear fellow, we shall be able to return to our beds at the conclusion of our little errand of goodwill. Uh, right oh, Bish. Without disturbing the domestic staff. Then for the present, tip tip, Milliner. Toodle doo, Bish. He took up his pen and resumed his composition. Out in the sweet-scented night, he could hear the four voices dying away in the distance. They seemed to be singing an old English part song. He smiled benevolently. A merry heart doth good like medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Guy's accent, huh? <laughs> <laughs>